thanks very much. My, my new book, uh, the blurb on the back says there's something here to offend everybody. It, uh, it takes on the left and the right, so, uh, so it's an equal offence book. Uh, George, uh, this is a wonderful facility. He deserves enormous congratulations. It wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him. And the thing is, it's kept him young. He's, he's not nearly as young as he looks. Whereas I'm much younger than I look. And <laughs> it's those lousy Irish genes, you know. That, uh, uh, and uh, I was here for the first iteration of the Institute when it opened as a tiny operation down in... Um, down in the St. John of God Hospital, and uh, then I was able to just wing it when I gave a talk, and now I'm declined intellectually to the point I actually have to write it out. <laughs> and some of my lines have already been used, so I can lose those out, leave those out. You know, from little things, big things grow. Paul Kelly, right? Yeah. Not the, not the Australian columnist, but the, uh, the singer. So I was involved in the, in, in the first iteration of this, and it's great to see this new facility. It really is a fantastic facility. The labs are just absolutely state-of-the-art. They're open-plan labs, uh, really, really nice uh, and extremely well-equipped. And it's, it looks so new. I mean, actually, universe, uh, research labs get very dilapidated very quickly when there are a lot of people working in them. So I hope to come back in a few years' time and it'll look a bit more worn. And, uh, and, uh, but I, I, I suspect that by the time I get back here, George will have been progressively taking over this building, so there'll be new labs anyway. So uh, with your help and, and your money, <laughs> uh, I understand this was formerly the School of Mines, and it's a great building. I mean, it's a wonderful historic precinct, I must say. Uh, terrific to see this being preserved in a city. And uh, it's long catered to the well-being of the citizens of Ballarat, both as, a, as, a, as a, an educational facility. And then it became a brewery, so it's still catered to the, to the, uh, to the, good, uh, to, to the well-being of the citizens, but maybe not to their good health, especially if, as my Methodist ancestors, I'm half Catholic, half Methodist in my ancestry, which makes me a very mixed up person. <laughs> but, uh, but they were always on about the demon drink. I saw a lot more of the Methodists than I did. Yeah. There are two things you couldn't do in Methodism is drink or dance. Uh, I don't know why dancing was so wicked. But, uh, so this is a small operation in the world of biological research. So how can it really contribute to, to something that's so massive globally? And, but the answer is that science and, and advances in science are all about, in, about people. They're about informed and intellectually incisive individuals working together and sharing findings for the good, general good. We publish our findings for all to read and critique. That's really what's driven the advance of science, and that's a bit what my book is about. There's a, it's only when we started to publish and we started to actually look at the thing itself, not to think about it, but to actually look at what's there. And that's what science is about. And we publish so everyone else can repeat. And when you think about it, modern science, which begins in about the 17th century, you really couldn't begin until we had the printing press because you couldn't publish it. You know, if you were writing out illuminated manuscripts, not a lot of people were going to read those. And uh, so there are no faceless men or women in science, in publicly funded science. Uh, it's, we're, we live by our names and our reputations. That's what we are. It's about, science is about people and institutions. Nothing gets done if you don't have decent laboratories and state-of-the-art equipment and ready access to whatever it is that you're aiming to study. You have to have the latest equipment. I, I think we're realising that that means a lot more we're going to have to share across the whole Australian spectrum, uh, share across the Victorian spectrum, across the universities and all the rest of it, because some of this equipment is very, very, uh, very, very expensive. And uh, the synchrotron, for instance, is, uh, is a national resource, though it's not necessarily funded as that yet. But the Fiona Elsie makes Ballarat part of this global process. It's a small part, but it makes you part of that process. So what does it have to offer? And to the medical sciences, if you like. It's a good-sized city with an oncology program based around St John of God that I understand extends to about 200,000 people. That's a good pool of patients. Operating, and then you've got operate, you've got our national medical insurance scheme. And the way our national medical insurance 
works is because it's a nationally funded scheme, you can have good long-term cohorts of patients that you can go back and look at. Uh, the Scandinavians are a bit the same. The, the US, though, is a disaster because of the way their disastrous medical insurance thing. Extraordinarily expensive and delivers less than our scheme delivers. And we, we should stick with what we've got that works, actually, in this and, and be very careful about what we do. Um, so having those long-term cohorts is really, really important because, as George said, they've been storing samples right from the outset. And that's very important too because what happens is the cancers remain the same, but the technology improves all the time. So the St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, which George mentioned, that I was involved, I'm involved in still, though I'm mainly, mainly in Melbourne now. But, I'm, but, but they, from 1962 when that institute was funded, first, they stored samples of every cancer. And of course, they've got wonderful records of what happened to all the patients. This is a place that treats all kids free, and it relies on enormous public donation. It actually raised $1 billion in public donation last year. Uh, enormous fundraising operation that works with Hollywood and uh, all the national TV and uh, country singers, everything. You think of it, they get money out of them. They get blood and money out of a stone. You know, they have bike they have trikathons. They get it out of four-year-olds. Uh, so they're really good at screwing money out of people. <laughs> you need a good fundraiser, I tell you. But uh, it's, um, it's, it's really powerful. But the fact is that when new molecular technologies came along, and these didn't come along until the 80s and the 90s, they were able to go back and look at those early cancers. Pediatric cancers are actually very rare. So, but they have really good cohorts because they've been collecting since 1962. And they've made enormous advances in the genetics of childhood cancer as a result of that. So that's what you've got to offer here too. Not, not in the sense of, of you'd cover those rare cancers, but you'd have very good long-term records on a lot of the common cancers, how the people were treated, what the samples were, and all the rest of it. And that's why you need an institution to actually do that. You can't just bring those things in from, from, from nowhere. And, um, and just as a story of humanity is written in our genes, you know, the real story of humanity is not in an evolution, really isn't in fossils and all the rest of it, though that's part of it. It's actually written in our own genes. Uh, you look at the genetic material, you can trace evolution through genetics. And um, the, the history of a cancer is written in the cancer's genes what's happened, why it's a cancer. And that's the sort of information we're progressively running down now. And we're running it down in all sorts of places right across the planet, and this will be one place where we can also do that sort of work. Um, it's, you're, we're looking for aberrant genetic profiles, we're looking for consistencies, and we're looking for targets for therapy. And, and this work is all published, of course, it's all public science, and that will allow the, allow the development of new uh, technologies, new diagnostics, new gene therapies, new other types of therapies, diagnostic gene chips. We're just starting to see those so that you'll be able to say someone's got some sort of cancer, but this is, this is how we think it is. It's this variant of the cancer, not that variant, as we, as we get this sort of technology worked out better. There's a lot of work in this, and it's long term, and it's not going to happen that quickly, but it'll, it's happening. Um, so, so Ballarat is, is part of that. And, it's also well set up to do clinical trials, and some clinical trials have already been in progress here because you have those records, you have those patient pools. And being in clinical trials is, again, actually, it's apart from the, the, the general good of helping, uh, helping cancer patients, it also positions you as a place where there is economic activity around that because a lot of drug companies around the world are looking for places where they can do decent clinical trials, and Australia is quite well set up to do it. Our regulatory environment is very sane and sensible, and that's really been the effort of the professionals over the years in keeping the lawyers at bay. You know, you've got to beat them off and make sure the politicians don't go mad. We love politicians, but we don't always love them totally. Um, <laughs> And the particular focus here, as George said, is on the infiltrating inflammatory and immune cells in cancer. It's the cutting edge of what's happening in oncology. There's that, all that genetic screening going on, but really it's those cells that come into the cancer that are proving to be enormously interesting. This is my research field of immunology, and it's been a very strong area in Australia because it was established by Burnett, uh, McFarlane Burnett, so McFarlane Burnett, who won the Nobel Prize in 1960, uh, second 
Randall III, director of the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute, and, uh, and of course he's been an enormous force in Australian science, both in the field of virology that my friend Damien Purcell pursues, and, uh, and, in, and in the field of immunology. Latterly, of course, the Hall Institute has also become a very, very powerful institute in oncology. It's a wonderful institution, it's our top biomedical research institute, and of course George is a product of that. Um, the in the, in the not too distant past, the haematology oncology specialists, that's what George does, it tended to regard immunology as too complicated and of little benefit for treatment. And actually that was true. There wasn't much benefit for treatment. We could see from the side of immune system, the immune system. On the other hand, immunologists like me, who would occasionally try and do experiments in cancer, got nowhere. We thought it was TBH, too bloody hard. And it is hard. It is hard. Cancer is hard. It's complicated. It's hard. And it's, there's various reasons for it. My, my area of research is, is easier in the sense I look at the host response to viruses, to pathogens, to things that are coming in from outside. When something's coming in from outside, then the whole immune system gets mobilised very well. And, and we talk about it in immunological terms very much the way Burnett pushed it, as non-self. We, we, we're reacting to non-self. We have to get rid of that because otherwise it will take us over. You know, infections about very simple organisms that can change very quickly, living in and on us. We are ecosystems, environments, whole countries for them, if you like, and, and we have to get rid of them. They're our invaders. That, that's, that's not so hard. That's what the immune system has evolved to do, we think. On the other hand, cancer in the main is a relatively late onset disease. That means it doesn't have that much impact on evolution, in fact, whereas infection has enormous impact on evolution. And the, the issue with cancer is that whereas the virus is non-self, and it's easy for the immune system to see that it's not supposed to be there, that the cancer cell is almost self. And that's much harder. And we thought for a long time, maybe the immune system's not seeing it. We have all these lymphocytes, white blood cells, the cells of the immune system sitting in the cancer. They've come into the cancer from outside, but they don't seem to be doing much. And maybe it's they're just stuck there, or they, 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 they got there by mistake, or they're, 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 they're just bludgers, you know. Not lefters, they're leaners, and they're leaning, and, and they're just sitting around and doing nothing. Um, yeah, so. So we, we got the Nobel Prize for working out that some of these white blood cells are killer T cells. We worked out something about how they work and what their recognition is. Uh, we were working in a tiny laboratory in Canberra at that time, but it was state of the art and had bright people around. And we weren't recognised as being a major force on the international scene. Suddenly we came in over and we overturned a whole area of science. That's what wins Nobel Prizes, what's called a paradigm shifting discovery, when you actually overturn a whole area of science. And actually it was not bad being rather isolated somewhere because you got about it quietly. Of course this is pre-email, pre the chatter of email, but you got about it quietly and you went on and did the work and then suddenly you had a very good story to tell. So we've known for a long time that these cells can, are fantastically good at bumping off other cells. They're the hit men of the immune system. Dr. Blake would love them. And uh, they, they can kill virus-infected cells, kill those factories of virus-infected cells off very well. Not so good, though, at bumping off cancer cells unless they're virus-induced cancers. There's, we're all infected, pretty much all of us in this room are infected with a virus called Epstein-Barr virus. It causes infectious mononucleosis or kissing disease in adolescence. And we are infected with that for life. It's one of these herpes viruses which hides away. And when we get older, if we're immunosuppressed massively, say, to treatment for cancer or something like that, or if we're immunosuppressed by being infected with the AIDS virus before the anti-AIDS treatment came along, uh, that can cause lymphomas. And we can die from those lymphomas. So they're tumours. This is a cancer-causing virus. It gets, it, what happens is if the immune system is zapped, it gets out from immune control, and this virus can cause cancer. And we've known for quite a while that if we actually grew up the killer T cells in, say, uh, and transferred them in, in, say, a bone marrow transplant recipient, and we purified them so they weren't reacting against the host, we could actually zap these tumours. So we knew we could kill some tumours with with these T lymphocytes, these killer T cells, these killer white blood cells. But 
that was a virus-induced tumour, and it had virus proteins on it. So that's not really analogous to the sort of tumour we normally had. Most, most cancers we get are not obviously caused by, by viruses. Um, so that was the case for a long time. So we knew we had these killer T cells sitting in the tumours, and it had been worked out over the years that some of those killer T cells, when you grew them out in, in tissue cultures, you got them out in a lab like the one upstairs, and you grew it out in culture, that they could be made to kill those tumours. But they weren't doing the job in the tumour. So what was it they were doing? Why weren't they, they functioning? Well, it turned out a really, a, a, a guy called Jim Allison, who I've known for many years, very good scientist, American, uh, worked out there's an inhibitory receptor on these, there's a, a receptor on these cells, and there's something binding to it which is turning them off. He, it's called CTLA4, the one he studied. There are now more of these things that are known. And Jim established with another new technology that came along in the 1980s called the monoclonal antibody technology. This is where you can take an antibody of a single specificity. You know, the antibodies are these things that float around in our blood. They're proteins, and they, they're, they're the basis of vaccination. If we've got antibodies against a virus because of a vaccination, then we won't get the infection. We don't get polio because we've got antibodies to polio because we've been vaccinated. But they made these antibodies in, in, in cultures, and they grew them up. They're all produced by cells. All, all the immune system is about white blood cells, and the antibodies are produced by the antibody producing cells, and you can grow them up in culture. You can grow them up in big fermenter tanks. I think you have fermenter tanks from the brewery here. They're big brass or copper ones. The copper ones, they won't do, but, but George will be after you for money for fermenters before you know where you are. It'll probably be, be disguised as being a biotech company where you'll probably lose your money anyway, but uh, as, as most people do. But he'll be trying to get you to buy fermenters next, don't worry. And, so you can grow these monoclonal antibodies up in enormous, enormous amounts. And these are the antibodies that are, being, that are increasingly, uh, CLL, uh, uh, ALL certainly, CLL being used, monoclonal antibody therapies. Yeah, these are the therapies that George is talking about. But there's also this killer T cell therapy. So there are new targets to be found for those monoclonal antibodies. We call them MABs, monoclonal antibody, MAB, MAB queen of the fairies, the marvellous MABs. You know, here you can get into all sorts of stuff. But, uh, it's, um, the, the, but if you take these MABs, and instead of taking the ones that are against the tumour, you take them against this molecule CTLA4 that's on these killer cells, you can turn them back on again. And that's been a massive advance. And now we're finding with all sorts of different cancers that you can turn these killer T cells back on again. And these killer T cells, are, I mean, they're more, they're more aggressive than the mafia. They'll bump off everything associated with it. I don't know uh, if you watch Fargo on the TV, you know, everyone gets killed. Uh, or uh, I like murders, you know, that's why I know about Dr. Blake. Midsummer murders, everyone gets killed. I mean, you know, so, so, uh, so these are real hit men, and, uh, and we can wipe out these tumours. And th there are more of these things to be discovered. We call them as check point inhibitors. There are more of them to be discovered, and it's not impossible they could be discovered here just as well as they could be discovered anywhere else. And it's not impossible that new, new therapeutics could be pioneered here just as they're pioneered everywhere else. The main problem with these things is the cost. Uh, they're enormously expensive to make. That's the real issue. And that's ramping up a lot of costs in the medical area, and it's why our politicians are so concerned, and they're justifiably concerned. All medical systems are under enormous pressure, uh, financial pressure cost around the world. They're expensive because they're in patent protection, and the drug companies say they have to recover their costs. You know, the drug companies do have costs. I've been to, uh, I, I was at Merck in, 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 uh, in, 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 um, in Pennsylvania it was, and, and you know, we were late for, late for dinner and we had to take the helicopter to dinner. It was, it's, it, they really have big costs, uh, the drug companies. Uh, you know, um, a certain uh, prominent local politician would have uh, fitted in very well. So. <laughs> Don't know if she took the helicopter up to Ballarat, but uh, um, so, um, so basically this is very expensive. It's expensive because of patent and they're expensive to produce because they have to be uh, produced under what we call GMP conditions. And that's good manufacturing practice. Anything you inject back into humans in an ethical facility, and we're talking about the sort of facilities we have in medical f uh, hospitals. Not the sort of thing where you can go and get stem cell therapy in Thailand, or you can go to Switzerland and be injected with ground-up sheep organs. That doesn't require anything 
at all. And, uh, but people think that's healthy. Uh, for some, some reason, I will never understand. But, but if you're making these products for, for use in humans, you, it, it's a very expensive operation. It has to be done with great, uh, great skill and, uh, and so forth. And again, that would be an area where, say, someone like Ballarat could have, say, a GMP resource that would be producing a lot of stuff nationally and internationally. Because these things are not important, to sh uh, expensive to put on planes and so forth. It's not like shipping cars. It's the sort of thing you can ship anywhere. So that's, I think, uh, part of the type of, type of future that you can see coming out of something like this. And having this kind of resource here does position you to some extent in, in, uh, in that type of study and the type of possibility and that type of economic possibility as well as therapeutic po possibilities. So the, the Institute has clearly benefited enormously from the, from the uh, I mean, the, the driving force, force that George has brought to it, from the people he's recruited, and also it's benefited enormously from the support we've had, that you've had from, from individuals and uh, I, I think also from uh, um, a government to some extent, but not, not as much as we might like. I think it's very important as individuals in society if you think this is important, and you think this is important for our future, is you speak up for uh, research funding. You speak up for the National Health and Medical Research Council funding. Uh, the, the, probably the, the positive legacy of Tony Abbott will po probably be the new Medical Research Futures Fund. Uh, that will be something he can definitely be proud of in the long term. It's probably going to be more translational, and what we're talking about is translation of research discovery into, into actual uh, uh, clinical well-being. Uh, don't forget to speak up for the Australia Research Council. It's uh, biomedical, Australia Research Council, if you don't know the difference, funds all the research in the country that's not biomedical pretty much most of it. Uh, there's various other things as well, like the Marine Institute in Townsville or the Antarctic Division that are separately funded, CSRO is separately funded. But Australia Research Institute funds university research in areas that are not medical. But the nature of bio modern biomedical research is such that we're as much involved with the chemists and the statisticians and the nanotechnologists and the physicists as we are with clinical doctors. I mean, it's, it's right across the board. What we're seeing more and more is these big groupings. It's recognised through the centres of excellence that the Australia Research Council has. I chair uh, the board of one of them, the one of the nanotechnology ones uh, based around Monash's School of Pharmacy, but involving people all around the country. And so these are really important. So speak up for research funding. It is really important. They're the best reviewed and best scrutinised dollars that go out from the federal government. They're not pork barrel, they go out on the basis of proper review and proper evaluation. And uh, of course, that doesn't actually make the politicians happy with them because they can't hand them out, but, uh, but it's, it's, it's a really important area. And speak up for it to, you, to your political representative, whether they're from, the, from whatever side of the political spectrum they come. Um, the, the types of things we also need for this sort of research very much are the synchrotron, uh, which has struggled uh, to find funding. There are various historical reasons for that, but it's a very important national resource. It means our scientists can do all sorts of things in Australia that they previously had to get on a plane and book time in Chicago or in Japan or in Switzerland. Now, and when they got there, sometimes the thing would be down and they'd lose their time. And so it really was very frustrating. The, the equipment, we, the facility we have in Melbourne is, is state of the art and it's the best in the, in the Southern Hemisphere as far as I'm aware. Uh, it certainly was when it was built. And so that needs to be supported and we need to support things like the ANSTO, which is the nuclear reactor in Sydney, which does some of the same sort of things and again is somewhat underfunded. So there's a lot of issues there that we can speak up for and we can speak to government about. Um, so that's about, I guess, mostly what I've got to say. It's, uh, I think your enthusiasm and support has been enormously important and I, I'm, I'm sure it will continue because this seems to be a real community. And, and just a bit, a bit outrageous, um, you know, putting Fiona Elsie in here positions Ballarat a bit ahead of its time in a way. And, you know, you know what's going to happen is with climate change, water levels are going to rise. A lot of Melbournes are going to become uninhabitable. Um, there's, and you know, real estate developers are really strong in politics. I'd really work with the Melbourne real estate developers to get that thing at the top of Spring Street shut down and moved to Ballarat. <laughs> you know, it's a logical place for the capital, right? Yeah, okay, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. <laughs>